Cool. Um, my name's Paul Miles from Melbourne. Um, I'll be giving the first presentation. We have two excellent speakers to follow, uh, each of whom I'll introduce. Sorry, a minute. Um, so the title of my presentation is Does Short-Term Improvement in Quality of Recovery Affect um, Long-Term Outcomes? When I think about the sort of patient journey or the post-operative recovery period after surgery, I think of it conceptually in terms of um, uh, this graph. Which is not coming up yet. Ah, here we go. Um, so on that y-axis is sort of a measure of some sort of measure of health status such as quality of recovery or it could be functional status, uh, emotional well-being, uh, pain intensity and so on. And then across the x-axis of course is a number of days after surgery. And most patients undergoing minor surgery have a reduction in their sort of overall health status typically for a few days and that is expected to fully recover. Uh, and then to go on both to discharge and back to their normal daily lives. Uh, those, of course, having more extensive or major surgery have a, a, a longer dip in their overall health status. Uh, that typically lasts at least for a number of days, and then there's a gradual return to f what we hope is full recovery. But, of course, we know in our practice that there's a lot of patients, particularly those who are frail, elderly, with comorbidity, that if they suffer any serious post-operative complications will have a further or protracted dip that may last for a very long time. And in some cases, of course, they never fully recover. Uh, and sadly, of course, there are those that, um, as a consequence of these complications, um, uh, die typically within the first 30 days of surgery. Now, this is a conceptual framework that I've often thought about, and I'm interested in uh, clinical trials, clinical studies, uh, also clinical quality improvement, and, and how, do we, how do we measure these, this trajectory or these changes in health status, and more importantly, how can we demonstrate improvements in patient outcome, particularly uh, patient-centred outcomes or patient-reported outcome measures uh, when we're evaluating new drug treatments or other interventions that we believe improves um, the safety or, or comfort of patients after surgery. So our job as anesthesiologists, uh, um, at least the way I think about it, is our prime responsibility has always been to optimise or improve patient comfort throughout the perioperative process. Obviously in the traditional sense of the interoperative period and uh, the great wonders of general anesthesia itself, uh, but also in all the other um, interventions that we use to improve that comfort uh, in those hours and days after surgery. And of course not forgetting the preoperative period as well, uh, dealing with things such as um, anxiety, uh, sleep disturbance uh, and other, um, other issues. And with that, I think, for me at least, it, it's to improve that overall quality of recovery um, in the postoperative period. Obviously, us, uh, the surgeons, and all others involved in perioperative care uh, are wanting to avoid any um, serious complications after surgery, traditional complications that we all know about, acute kidney injury, respiratory complications, sepsis, and so on. Uh, and our patient's wish, of course, is to go through that surgical journey um, as well or as safe as possible, uh, ideally avoiding both complications having a good quality of recovery, and then wanting to get home to their daily lives, uh, both obviously with their families, in many cases, back to work. The whole point of surgery, however, is nearly always to improve disability-free survival. Either it's uh, a life-threatening condition, or it's a, a condition that is associated with a lot of pain or discomfort, and the point of the surgery, of course, is to relieve those, those conditions. But it astounds me that really very little research is being done on disability-free survival, despite the fact that it seems to me at least to be the whole point of most surgical procedures. So I've spent now more than 25 years thinking about how we can better measure overall um, quality of recovery, particularly as rated by the patients themselves. 
And these quality of recovery scores have been extensively validated both by our group and many others around the world. And I want to quote, focus in on the core 15, the 15 item quality of recovery scale. So this um, scale itself has got 15 questions, this is um, our responses zero to 10 with a maximum score of 150. Uh, we did an analysis that we published last year in the British Journal of Anesthesia, which uh, in fact found 26 studies that had done validation work of this core 15 scale. Uh, it's been extensively um, validated uh, in many languages uh, in many parts of the world. And overall, uh, it's been consistently demonstrated to have excellent discriminant validity and good convergent validity, meaning that it actually tracks uh, what we would think and what our patients would think is overall quality of recovery. And internal consistency and reliability metrics uh, are really measures of how um, uh, reproducible or reliable uh, any particular score is at a point in time, and correlation values of 0.8 or greater are rated as excellent. And the high responsiveness statistic really tells us that it's very responsive to changes in, in clinical condition. So values, are, again, of, of over 0.7, in this case 0.87, uh, demonstrate that it's very sensitive to changes in clinical condition, such that we can pick up improvements in care associated with any interventions that we would choose to study. So um, I've been most interested now in trying to quantify that conceptual framework I gave you in my first slide and actually map exactly how the trajectory uh, of recovery occurs over at least the first 30 days after surgery. Uh, and we therefore intensively measured daily core 15 scores and measured the number of days at home within the third, first 30 days of surgery, DAH30, uh, with three types of surgery. We picked gastroscopy as a control group. It's a minor procedure in which we anticipate uh, very minimal reduction in health status and then, and then return to normal health uh, soon after. An intermediate group of surgical procedures, most particularly hip and knee arthroplasty, and cardiac surgery, of course, as a major, uh, a type of major surgery. And our hypothesis, which might seem obvious but needed to be quantified, was uh, there would be differences, of course, across those three um, uh, surgical groups. So we went through a, a study process at consenting all patients. We took baseline measures of uh, the core 15 scale, and then we asked patients to rate their recovery every single day for the first two weeks after surgery, and then weekly for a further month, and then monthly out to three months after surgery. So the patients themselves had to do this on 19 occasions, and most of it was done through a, um, um, uh, a, a website or an app with automatic data loaded into REDCap. And we defined full recovery uh, when two or more sequential core 15 scores had reached uh, close to their baseline score. So here is the actual data. This is not yet published. It's under peer review at the moment. Uh, and it demonstrates quite clear, of course, there is a marked difference in both the nadir, or the minimum core 15 score in the first days after surgery, and of course the slope or the trajectory right out to 90 days after surgery. And typically the minor surgery group recover within a few days, as you might expect. Um, the intermediate surgery, it takes two to three weeks, and major surgery, four to six weeks before they get back to their score. And you might notice out to day 90, in fact, uh, for the intermediate and major surgery groups, the scores are higher than baseline, indicating genuine improvement in health status uh, as a result of the surgical procedure they were having. So these data are really useful both to demonstrate the validity of the score itself, but more importantly, to set benchmarks for any quality improvement that any group may choose to do around, for instance, instance joint arthroplasty or other types of surgery. Um, as I said, the full recovery, typically at one week after surgery, 70% of the um, minor surgery group had fully recovered, 37% um, and then 19% for the major surgery cardiac group. And there was a correlation between the core 15 score um, in the first, or the median score across that 
recovery period and the number of home days in the first 30 days after surgery. So this um, uh, relationship or association is a, is a measure of the validity of actually measuring early quality of recovery and it being strongly associated with uh, more complete recovery and returning home after surgery. After surgery. Uh, and obviously the number of days at home in those that did and did not have a complications, uh, had complications was quite different. Overall, there's roughly five extra days in the hospital system or in rehab rather than their own home, purely associated with complications. So again, this metric, this DAH30, uh, is a good indicator or quantifier of what would be a successful surgical process. Now, this idea of days at home or healthy healthy home days uh, is not new uh, in our world. It's being used by other groups, uh, other areas of medicine around the world. I found this paper particularly interesting. It came uh, from the US, over 6 million US Medicare beneficiaries, and they were actually benchmarking hospitals, looking at um, similar procedures, demonstrating that there seemed to be essentially a, a marked difference or variability or variation in outcomes. Uh, in older patients having a variety of surgeries. And they felt these, this concept of healthy days at home, uh, very similar to our metric, uh, in fact, is a, a quantifier of good quality care, and therefore patient-centred outcome. Now, we actually have looked at that more closely, working with a group from the Karolinska um, in Sweden, that's Max Bell on the left and Lars Eriksson on the right. Uh, I was working with them a few years ago uh, and we took Swedish data and, and merged it and cross-linked it with the Karolinska Institute um, information systems uh, to look really at um, a whole lot of uh, patients having all sorts of surgery to really, I guess, validate this concept of days at home after surgery. And looking um, down that sort of first column, the DAH30, you can see that um, uh, patients who spend less and less days at home in that first 30 days of surgery are much more likely to have suffered acute kidney injury, myocardial infarction, cardiac arrest, deep vein thrombosis, delirium, and overall any serious complication after surgery. So even if you don't know what happened, the fact that patients are spending less days at home or less than average is an indicator or a quantifier of poor quality um, uh, um, or, or failed surgical um, procedures. In other words, you don't even have to know or detect the complications themselves. You can simply ask and find out, typically through um, uh, data registries, um, how any, any particular surgical group, hospital, uh, or otherwise is, is against the, the, the national averages. And this is just more detail around uh, that study. I won't go through all of it because it's quite complicated. Other than you look across at the far, the far right column, the adjusted difference in days, it tells you the number of days lost because of any particular complication. So these are typically extra days in the healthcare system um, rather than, than being in their own home after surgery. Uh, we use these data actually to look right out to one year after surgery and the number of days at home uh, within the first month after surgery is predictive um, of longer term uh, survival. So again, it's an important early metric of the full trajectory after that surgery process right out to one year after surgery. So obviously seeing uh, less days at home, uh, much higher risk of, um, of mortality in that first year. So if we come back to that sort of um, conceptual framework I gave you at the start, to try and actually quantify or better understand or better evaluate new treatments, then I strongly believe that if you're interested in those first few days after surgery, then measuring quality of recovery, I would recommend the Core 15 scale to do that and you can pick up any improvements in care that might otherwise occur. Uh, if you're interested in the first 30 days after surgery, then the number of home days out to day 30. And of course, we need to link that in many cases to longer term disability free survival. So in conclusion, I think a patient's trajectory can be quantified in the perioperative period 
using both the core 15 scale and the number of home days out to day 30. Those undergoing more extensive surgery, those who suffer post-operative complications, we can demonstrate do in fact have a poor recovery after surgery and they have less days at home in that first 30 days. So any proposed advance in surgery anaesthesia, either as quality improvement or in clinical research, um, needs to be quantified uh, and that should be demonstrated by better quality of recovery and in higher number of home days after surgery. Thanks very much. Um, so it's my great pleasure now to welcome our next speaker, which is Monty Mython, I think is known to um, many of you in the audience. He's now pr uh, Professor Emeritus of Anesthesia Critical Care at University College London. He's Chair of EBPOM, the Evidence-Based Preoperative Medicine Consortium, the Founding Editor of the journal Preoperative Medicine, the Founding Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, uh, and the Founding Board Member of the Preoperative Quality in Initiative, the POKI Group. Uh, Monty. Thanks very much, Paul. Good to see you all. Welcome to another World Congress. Uh, aside from the introduction you just heard, I have another disclosure, which is as of August last year, I became the Senior Vice President of Medical Affairs for Edwards Life Sciences, but I will not be discussing any of their products in this talk. I do not think there's a direct conflict of interest. My two takeaways from this talk are we should ask a patient what matters to them, not what is the matter with them, something that I learned from a patient in the last decade of my clinical practice. And the other thing which I think I learned the hard way over 40 years in intensive care is you can't know another person's mind. So disability-free survival. I heard Paul Miles talk about this over a number of years and eventually thought I'd better find out exactly what it means because I was chairing the data safety monitoring board for this trial, the relief trial, and disability-free survival at one year was the primary outcome, even though most of us probably remember the secondary outcome, which was the influence of the amount of fluid on the rate of acute kidney injury. And one of the striking features at the end of the study, which Paul has just been referring to indirectly, is that 80, roughly 80% in both groups had disability-free survival at one year, which means roughly one in five people did not have disability-free survival at one year after major abdominal surgery. In preparing for this talk, I picked up on this paper, which, which is a, an attempt to summarize what matters to elderly people after major surgery. This is the ask people what matters to them, not what is the matter component of this short talk. They surveyed 101 consecutive older people one year after elective inpatient non-cardiac surgery. Patients most commonly had orthopedic, thoracic, urological, or gynecological surgery. As you'd expect with older people, I now relate to this myself, most lived with comorbidity of some form. A third were frail, and there's a great session coming up on frailty next. And over a quarter screened positive for mild to moderate cognitive dysfunction. There's also great sessions at this conference about that. If you looked at the ratings of these 101 patients, not surprisingly, length of stay, where they were discharged to, disability, new disability, disability-free survival and complications all ranked very highly. You could say that days at home and length of stay ranked less strongly than the others. There's also a quite a neat figure in this particular publication, which I think draws it home for us when these 101 elderly people were asked to trade off the different components of recovery which is represented by the percentage in the box that is closer to one node or another, they almost never valued length of stay in hospital above any of the other things that could happen to them. So new disability or disability or complications was more important than length of stay in hospital. They were all quite concerned about complications, but they also had some trade-offs with regards to dislo discharge location, etc. And it was individually variable, but quite a lot of consistency. Now let's tell a little story. We've got two patients here. This is, uh, as they often say in the movies, this is based on real life experience. We've got Vera, who's a female, and we've got Jack, who's a male. I would suggest to you those two images immediately bring to bear some biases about who we think will do best following major surgery. 
How old are they? They're both in their mid-80s. Comorbidities, well, they both have hypertension, essential hypertension controlled with one tablet quite successfully, and they both have hyperlipidemia and they're on statins that's made the number look more normal. Jack also has a history of smoking. He still smokes heavily. He's a vascular path. He's had two previous MIs and one stroke. He's mildly dysphagic. And he's got chronic kidney disease. Uh, Vera has none of those. She has severe crippling arthritis. Two years ago, she decided not to have her knees replaced because she was living at home. And what mattered to her most was staying living at home and making it to her granddaughter's wedding in Spain. Vera is now in a care home. She's actually in the same care home as Jack. It's a nice private care home because they're both reasonably wealthy upper middle class individuals with a highly functioning family. Um, from the fitness perspective, Jack is fit as a butcher's dog, as we would say in England. Irritatingly so, because it's combined from the care home's perspective with his now quite severe and marked dementia, which means he runs around the care home trying to get into bed with other female residents, thinking that they're his, and this is all based on true stories, his uh, now sadly departed wife. Uh, meanwhile, Vera uh, has no problems at all mentally. She's very sharp. She does the crossword every day. She helps her grandchildren do their homework. And Vera's kidneys, if I didn't mention it, work fine, so she doesn't have chronic kidney disease. So she's dementia-free without chronic kidney disease. Pertinent to the story, they both had the big conversation. So they have fu highly functional families, and within those families they have doctors, nurses, accountants, and lawyers. And they've both recorded exactly what they want at the end of their lives. They've signed over enduring power of attorney. Their wills are in good order. They've said how they would like to depart this world. They've even chosen the hymns for their funeral to reduce that tension from the family situation. So let's try and give some sort of context as to um, what's going to happen if these two are exposed to a surgical procedure. I should have said the surgery that they're up for is that Vera has decided now to have her major joints replaced, in particular her knees in the first instance that are giving her the greatest pain and disability. Jack's family has decided that he should now go for carotid endarterectomy because Jack made it clear that if he appeared to be enjoying life, he was up for potentially life-saving surgery, and he was now starting to have mini strokes and was probably going to have a massive life-threatening stroke. So they've most made a decision to go for surgery. Let's try and put those decisions in the context of this paper, led by Paul Miles, first author Shulman, published recently in Anesthesiology. You can read there with me what it's about. It's looking at the disability-free survival after surgery, and whether there are factors that allow us to predict death in the older patient. I won't go into the detail too much. Over 2,000 patients, they do some internal validation of a score they develop, and then some external validation. I'll cut more quickly to the result. They principally looked at the HUDAS score, and the HUDAS score was recorded preoperatively in all of the patients that they looked at. That's the W. Uh, the uh, disability after a uh, surgery score. And they said a score of 5% or greater was a clinically important difference. Disability-free survival was alive with a HUDAS score less than 16%. Clinically significant disability was a score of 35% or greater, and new onset clinically significant disability was an increase in the HUDAS score of 5% or greater the score of 35% or greater. Now, that doesn't mean much to most of us who don't do HUDAS scores on a regular basis. So let's remind ourselves what's in the HUDAS score, the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule 2.0, a 12-item self-administered score, although you can administer it on, the, on behalf of other people. And when you look at the scoring elements, if you're not familiar with doing this on a regular basis, try and imagine the score that our two patients would have Vera because of her physical disability, or Jack mainly because of his dementia-driven disability. So there are 12 elements to it. You score a zero for none, a one, two, three, or four for mild through to extreme or cannot do. The first five elements, you can read with me there, are standing for long periods, 
taking care of your household responsibility, learning a new task, joining in community activities, and have you been emotionally affected by your health problems? So you can imagine the physical disabilities that Vera have would load scores in one area, the mental disability that Jack has would load his in another area. Then go on to the final elements, concentrating on doing something for 10 minutes, walking a long distance. You can see that Jack and Vera are either end of the spectrum here. Washing your whole body, getting dressed, dealing with people you don't know, maintaining a friendship in your day-to-day -day work. So what about the results of Paul and his colleagues' study? Well, I'll read these through with you. We're looking here at three months and six months. The first thing to note is that the mortality rate at three months is around 3%. At six months, it's around 12%. If you then look at disability or death, it's 38% and 42%. Significant disability, around 16% and 23%. And then we get to the difficult area. Significant increase in disability at three months, 28.8%. Six months is 33.4%, but a significant decrease in disability at 32% and 31.2%. So try and put that information in the context of shared decision-making and truly informed consent and those complicated discussions. So one other thing to help us with that challenge is that Paul and colleagues developed a score. So they took a subset of their cohorts. They looked at the predictive elements they then used some internal validation, if I've got this right, Paul, and then they reused the release study patients to do some external validation. And they said, if you look at the HUDAS score, the patient age, the presence or absence and the severity of dementia, and the same for kidney disease, you get a score that allows you to add to the shared decision-making, to say, however you choose to interpret this with your loved ones and in discussion with the clinicians, your chances of having disability-free survival are up or down by this magnitude. Let's finally put that in the context of you can't know other people's minds. This is a national survey conducted by my colleague Doug Blackwood, where he asked anaesthetists in the United Kingdom a list of questions about end of life. And to just touch on this very briefly, 750 plus respondents who are all anaesthetists or anesthesiologists asked questions like, do I want to know all the, the uh, details about my condition and my treatment if I become unwell? Do I want to have a say in every decision that's made about me clinically? And would I like to know how long I've got to live? Although the majority said yes, they would want those things, there's not an insignificant minority that wants to know nothing about their condition. These are anesthesiologists who completely hand themselves over to their carers and don't want to know how long they might have to live. Also, when you then look at what would happen next, they ask questions like, if I had an illness from which I'm going to die, um, would I pre be prepared to live for as long as possible, if, even if I was suffering, etc.? And where would I like to die? Which location would I prefer? There was a full spectrum going from what you'd anticipate from clinicians. In other words, I'd rather have quality of life, not quantity of life, through to people who say the sanctity of life and these are anesthesiologists and ethicists, is most important to me. And I was surprised to find that the majority of people would prefer to die in a hospice. I wasn't surprised to find that the next largest group was to die at home, followed by somewhere else, and not surprisingly, the minority uh, would prefer to die in a hospital, but some people would. So what happened to Vera and Jack? In our imaginary story based on a decades of patient experiences. Uh, Jack had his carotid end arterectomy. He was too demented to have it under local, so he had it under GA. Um, it went quite well. Uh, he had a cardiac arrest uh, in the early hours of the morning because his chronic bronchitis gave him breathing problems. He was resuscitated consistent with his wishes because he rescinded on his DNA CPR. Uh, he ended up on ITU. He developed uh, acute kidney injury on top of his chronic kidney disease. Treatment was withdrawn. He died within a few days, consistent with his wishes that were clearly documented with his enduring power of attorney, which was his daughter. He died peacefully, and everyone thought he had very high-quality care. Vera, over the course of a year, had both of her knees replaced. 
She made a full and excellent recovery. She was rich enough to get rehabilitation, both in the terms of nutrition and physiotherapy. And she returned home within two years and is now pruning roses in her garden. So my conclusion takeaways are, always ask a patient what matters to them, not what is the matter with them. And you can't know another person's minds. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Monty. I'd now like to introduce Anushka Afonso, who's Associate Professor of Clinical Anesthesiology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre in, the, in New York, where she's Director of their Enhanced Recovery Program, is also on the Board of Directors for the American Society of Enhanced Recovery. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I have no disclosures regarding this topic. Um, this is where I'm from. I've spent over a decade at Memorial Sloan Kettering, so please feel free to come visit. Um, so I'm going to talk about readmission and the impact of readmission. And it's very challenging because there's such variability by surgical subspecialty. Oops, what's going on here? There's a variability by procedure, and there's differences in reporting, and that varies in terms of, in different countries, how they collect, how they define, how they report their readmission data. So it's very hard to compare um, across regions. And time frame, usual time frame of readmissions being reported in papers is 30 days, because that's where usually readmissions happen. But a lot of papers also report in the 60 to 90 day time frame, so it's very hard in terms of comparison. This is a landmark study um, in the New England Journal in 2009 that really brought about the issue of readmissions, and it showed that about 20% of all Medicare discharges had a readmission in 30 days. 34% were readmitted within 90 days. Yes, medicine patients had a higher readmission, but surgical patients had about 15.6%. Um, this was another highly cited study in um, the readmission literature, and it basically shows that one seventh patients being discharged, one out of seven patients being discharged after undergoing major surgery were readmitted within 30 days. And Hospital readmissions is a very common metric, but what I thought was really interesting here is they also showed that high volume hospitals had lower readmission rates. So this suggests a potential association between surgical volume and quality of care. So for all of these reasons listed here, readmissions are costly in the tune of 15 to 20 billion dollars. I didn't say million, I said billion dollars annually. So preventing avoidable readmissions has a potential to profoundly affect and improve the quality of life for our patients and caregivers, but also improve the financial well-being of healthcare systems. These costs are astronom astronomical. So in response to such problems, multiple initiatives have been mandated in the United States uh, to reduce hospital readmissions. We have this hospital readmission reduction program, a program that actually penalizes hospitals and um, has a three, up to a 3% payment reduction in reimbursements for any readmission. So hospitals are being fined tremendously. How about the emotional toil? The emotional impact of readmissions remains understudied, despite the significance for both patients and caregivers. A study revealed that patients often felt that their readmission were avoidable, often linked to inadequate discharge timing and follow-up support. 
So although some of the data is mixed out there, there was a retrospective analysis using administrative data from the Veterans Affairs Hospital of matched 2353 patients over a period of a year. And then they followed them for about two years. And they found that those patients that were readmitted had a higher death rate than those that were not readmitted in 30 days. This JAMA article showed almost 2 million patients had almost 18% readmission within 90 days and that were for potentially preventable causes from the national readmission database. Those with public insurance had a higher odds of being readmitted than those with private insurance. So what are reasons after surgery that patients are readmitted? This is another study at, uh, from JAMA that looked at patients undergoing surgeries at hospitals uh, participating in NISQIP, the National College of Surgeon National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. That was a mouthful and examined clinically abstracted information from almost half a million operations from six diverse operations. 5.7 readmission rate, and common reasons were surgical site infection, which accounted for about 20% of readmissions, followed by obstruction, ileus, and bleeding. I put the slide up to really show you how complex it is. There are so many factors that are at play some that we can control, and some that we can't. So the ability to predict readmission risk is extremely valuable for hospitals, especially under this hospital readmission pro reduction program. Therefore, having validated and uh, accurate predictive risk modeling that estimate the risk of 30-day readmissions is critical for a success for any program. So there are several tools and prediction uh, scoring patterns out there to measure and predict the risk of prediction. This one on the left is the LACE. It's very commonly used. Uh, the one on the right is a hospital score system, um, and it assigns points. So basically, um, identifying these patients in terms of low-medium risk can really empower the healthcare teams to tailor clinical plans and allocate resources effectively. This risk stratification based on predictive modeling allows for targeted interventions, as you can see here, based on individual needs. What's really important here is real-time analytics need to be embedded within these programs and healthcare systems to allow for real-time immediate action rather than on relying for a report card in 30 days from now um, with no ability to affect patients' trajectories. So advances in machine learning really provide great opportunities in the prediction of hospital readmissions. There are multiple papers out there. These are just a few of the papers that uh, came out in the last few years. This is a study from Mayo. What I really liked about this paper is not only that they assessed through machine learning patients that were at risk for readmission, but they also coupled that with individualized assessments generated by artificial intelligence to reduce the readmission risk. For example, for certain patients, they would have cardiac rehab. For others, nutritional or pain management postoperatively. So um, especially in the high risk group, which was about 611, um, they dropped their readmission rates from 43% to 34% with the number needed of, to treat of 11. So, you know, I talked about the impact of readmissions and prediction tools. I'll touch upon a few examples of health information technology to tackle the issue of readmissions. So we can't underscore the importance of patient education. There's several innovative um, approaches that have emerged in terms of how we communicate with our patients during their perioperative journey. So what's a chat box? A chat box. It's a computer program that's designed to stimulate conversation with humans, very much like technologies like Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant. These chat box virtual assistants really help with continuous support, educating the patient, having patients adhere to medications, scheduling appointments, and really empowers the patient in terms of reducing the likelihood of complications requiring readmission. So, one of the most complicated medical needs of older adult, adults is managing their complex medication regimens. I know this from my late father who had about 15 medications that he would have to manage every day. And however, the use of technology to aid older adults is 
often impeded by the fact that their technological capabilities are lower than the rest of us, the rest of the population. So the use of medication-informed chat box with voice chat boxes really help, especially to overcome some of their uh, diminished vision, tactile dexterity issues when they're trying to um, text on a phone, and chat boxes can be connected with pharmacies, caregivers, and providers with frequent reminders to help medication adherence. So this randomized controlled trial involved 550 participants, shown when community healthcare workers met with patients prior to hospital discharge and maintained contact for about 30 days after they were discharged. And they showed that this contact this just contact, just contacting the patient after they, their discharge really made a difference with these older patients. They were less likely to be readmitted to the hospital. They were less likely to miss their appointments. Didn't have any impact in terms of ER visits, but this is important. So just the simple act of contacting a patient after their discharge makes a difference. This was another cohort study of 765 older patients across seven hospitals. And the simple intervention, again, of community nurses reaching out and potentially even visiting within 30 days had a significant decrease in hospital re readmission rates. So we know that 16% of readmissions are medication-related, and 40% of these are potentially preventable. Um, I thought this paper was really interesting for this reason. It was a randomized controlled trial. Um, and it looks very complicated, but this is the infographic, where they um, had behavioral nudges. And they personalized these individual needs by psychographic profiling, social factors, demographics, um, readmission risk scores. And they put it all into different buckets by machine learning. And what was really interesting is they also had nudge content or alerts or reminders um, and they tailored the frequency, the timing, how the patients wanted the reminders delivered to them, and feedback metrics. And this was all done by AI. And they tried to look at cardiology patients in terms of adherence to medication, and in this case, it was a statin. And then what they, they followed these patients in a year, and what they found was those that had a great, that had this uh, precision decision support, had higher adherence to medications, in this case, the statin. Virtual reality, pre-op education, anxiety, a lot of the data has been in pediatric patients and burn patients, um, but there's quite a lot of um, new non-pharmacologic treatment options for anxiety relief in this preoperative setting for patients and caregivers. So how we interact with our patients is constantly changing. So we need to reach them where they are. And in this day and age, most patients and physicians are on their smartphones. So this is a building where we do a lot of our ambulatory cancer surgery at Sloan Kettering. And uh, we have enhanced recovery protocols for all our 23-hour prostatect robotic prostatectomies, mastectomies. And we also have a remote patient monitoring, a recovery tracker, which is 10 days after they're discharged. And this has about 18 symptom questions, different areas. And what's really interesting is um, we look, we deliver patient feedback through these normograms. So these normograms are visually given back to the patient, so it tells the patient where they fit in, in terms of pain, nausea, And of course, if there are any alerts or they're above the normal, we reach out to them. So we have this enhanced feedback with normative data to our patients. And what we did find that there was a decrease in anxiety. And so adding this really improved the patient experience. So we had this patient tracker, and then we in, in, um, had um, implemented this. And what we did find that those um, after we implemented the recovery tracker, there's a 22% decrease in odds of an urgent care visit without readmission. And there was a 42% odds of an urgent care visit without readmission if they responded to at least one survey. So the landscape of healthcare is rapidly evolving, but we really have to keep in mind that uh, the, the social determinants of health. 
where the patients live, how, what is their community support, how do they have access, are they in rural areas, what is their education level? And so we have to take this in mind in terms of disparities in hospital readmissions. It's a very complex issue with urgent solutions. So in terms of future, we know that there are many different types of transition care models. Um, these are just a few of them. And we really have to use these in terms of care transitions, focusing on multidisciplinary collaboration, education, communication. So as we step back, we really have to think about this important topic and what can we do? We have all this innovation, yet despite the rapid pace of healthcare technology, we need to focus on the fundamentals of communication, transition points, medicine reconciliation, discharge planning, to really empower our patients and caregivers to manage their health and reduce readmissions so they too can have disability-free days at home. Thank you so much. Um, An Anushka, thank you very much for that really fantastic presentation. Um, for those of you who have downloaded and got access to the app, you can actually ask questions through that or otherwise, I think that's the way to do it actually. Um, it should come up here. I might start with Anushka if I may. I mean, you gave some really you know, fascinating options that uh, ideally can be targeted, the at-risk patient, uh, particularly around avoiding uh, readmissions. If you had to pick one thing of all the things that you either do yourself at Sloan Kettering or otherwise are reading in the literature, what's the one thing you think can really make a difference, particularly perhaps in lower resource settings? I think the one thing I would pick would be caregiver support. Um, may not be the answer other people would choose, but when you go home and you don't have anyone to support you, help with your medications, um, educate you, especially for the older patient population. I think that's 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 terrible. So the the lack of community support, caregiver support, would be my answer. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Monty. You made a point of uh, introducing us to uh, Vera and Jack, and I think you're making the point particularly around again around individualising care goals of care as well. How do you think that should tie in when deciding on what are the relevant outcomes um, in a clinical study or a quality improvement project? Uh, well, I, I think for, from the point of view of the outcome studies, uh, and then we go back to your talk there, we have to appreciate what really matters to patients and the outcomes that are now being much more commonly used, like Days at Home 30 or the, the short-term quality of recovery, seem to map on to uh, people's opinions, people's attitudes, what matters to them. So and this is a very helpful answer, but I think that the fact that we, the results that you showed in the study that I presented help us all appreciate that sometimes we've done large studies on what now appear to be quite ridiculous outcomes, like 28-day all-cause mortality, which doesn't really tell us very much at all about whether the intervention was impactful in a meaningful way. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I've got a question here. Um, I think it's for me. Can you comment on obese patients as a subgroup of uh, DAH30 regarding outcomes? Uh, a simple response is that's a great idea for a study. Um, obesity has got several features, I think, in the perioperative setting. Obviously, it's associated with other comorbidities. Uh, surprisingly, many of them are otherwise quite healthy. They're at risk of particularly sepsis, surgical side infections, and thromboembolism. But uh, uh, how they differ from a matched cohort undergoing similar surgery, um, uh, particularly from a patient-reported outcomes perspective, using, say, quality of recovery scores or home days after surgery, I think is still an open question. 
uh, that would be very worthy of study, um, uh, particularly given the very high prevalence of obesity in our communities. Paul, Paul can I ask you a question? I guess, yes. <laughs> how, how should I interpret or practically apply the results of your study that I presented with that, with that trade-off that appears to be there of a percentage that get better compared to a percentage that get worse? Yeah. How, think, how, how do I apply that? Uh, I think at two levels. One would be at, at the policy-making level. That, 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 you know, are there certain patient groups that perhaps shouldn't be offered a type of very invasive surgery when in fact there's a high chance of relatively poor outcomes? In other words, you're not satisfying the needs either of the patient themselves or the community. So I think at that level, um, as a mechanism for audit and outcome assessment, it's got that role. But equally, I think with more data than we've got right now it is again for clinical decision making. So and patients themselves will be given the opportunity, say, for instance, if they've got a painful hip or a painful knee, um, uh, but they're very old and frail, that in fact, yes, um, we can fix the hip or the knee pain or whatever it might be, but there is a high chance or a moderate chance of this particular longer term outcome. And again, that therefore becomes uh, very crucial in terms of informed decision making at the, at the individual level. And I'm sure there are circumstances where the patients, uh, like in your case studies, uh, would freely go ahead with the surgery, given uh, that better information. Because until recent times, we really had little um, objective data that could actually we used to um, uh, give the patients that information in a way that they can make that choice. But it, and I hope it came through with the examples that I gave from somebody who spent a lot of my life in surgical intensive care or general intensive care. If the end of life decisions and, the, and, and all the paperwork associated with it and the family discussions have happened beforehand, it makes everything so much easier if it doesn't go exactly how they hoped, but they knew what was coming. So you yeah. must deal with a lot of this, Anushka, in a cancer hospital. Yeah, I think so. Now, I've, I'll just see here we've got a few more questions. I had a quick question while we start. You know, I gave a little bit of the United States perspective in terms of readmission reduction programs. I would love to hear if there were any similar programs in, in where both of you hail from. I think, um, at least in the Australian context, which has got a national health system uh, for the vast, effect for all Australians, I think it's similar in many other countries. Um, we don't have the intensity of the oversight that exists, uh, particularly in the, the US. Um, I think readmissions are crucially important for all the reasons you clearly demonstrated, uh, including the, the cost, financial implications. Um, but sometimes um, uh, that you're missing the detail of what's going on and, and why is it going on. Uh, so I think it's one um, performance metric. Um, I guess it, it can be validated and so on. But I would often like to know what's happened up until that point of uh, discharge itself and then when and how the, the um, readmission happens. Uh, of course, if all your patients drop dead at home on day 10, your readmission rate will be quite low. Um, so you really need to, I think, include other components of what would be a very poor outcome after surgery. Um, right, so I've got a question. How does DAH30 account for the various post-discharge care programs such as hospital in the home? Uh, again, the purpose of that metric itself um, um, may be varied according to the question or concern you have in clinical practice. So I think a hospital in the home program, which I think ties in very much with what Anushka was talking about in terms of avoiding readmissions, is a wonderful cost-effective program in most settings. Uh, I, the, the data we have from our patient surveys is that patients would much prefer to be in their own home uh, and if they require a bit of further health care or nursing care in that setting, then they're perfectly happy. It's a relatively low cost model. Um, uh, it would otherwise be, um, I think, um, an acceptable 
uh, outcome process. Uh, so therefore, a hospital in the home in that setting would be counted as days at home um, uh, in a particular quality improvement project or study. However, in fact, if you've got other goals or your other interests um, in a study uh, and you feel that that of itself is an indicator of ongoing care that wouldn't otherwise need to happen, then of course you would define your home in that study a little differently. So these metrics, I think, need to be um, uh, sometimes slightly um, um, modified if, uh, according to the, the, the clinical questions you might have, uh, it will differ. But in general, uh, I count a person's home as success. Uh, they certainly haven't had a readmission. They haven't gone off to rehabilitation for a long period of time. Uh, they, they haven't uh, obviously died. Um, and it otherwise would be a successful outcome. Uh, I think this one might relate to you, Anushka. In the US Veterans Health Administration, shared decision making stops the line in about 50% of patients we see in a preoperative clinic. These patients do better in the short term and long term versus peers where the relentless march to surgery continues. Um, any comments about that? Yes, any type of preoperative evaluation. Is that the. Yeah. I, I couldn't hear it too well, but. Yeah. Um, preoperative evaluation has really changed management of a lot of patients, especially identification of high risk patients before they even get to surgery. So, really, optimization of these patients older patients, uh, making sure they have the support system, having those um, increased education endeavors, especially in those points of transition where errors happen, um, can really help in terms of um, identification of those high-risk groups. Yeah, and again, the comment from the, the questioner was around the fact that in their setting, they partner with the surgeons, I think, to get, obviously, a much more complete um, decision-making process, planning, and so on. I think that would be ideal. Yeah. I mean, it's what really what pre-op medicine has become in these last few decades. Um, so I'll move down to, in cardiac surgery, patients are given survival rates. Should we give them complications, and do we have robust data for that? Also, we have surgeons and patients that will take surgery at any cost. So how can we manage that? Uh, Monty, do you want to deal with that one? I didn't completely catch that, Paul. The acoustics up here are very difficult. They are terrible, actually. But anyway, I think the second part of it relates to um, there are surgeons and patients who yes. will want or accept surgery under, despite whatever risk, um, really, I guess, with the chance of any possibility of um, being cured or, or otherwise yeah. stabilised. And I, I think the relatively little data, but it's there, about the risk tolerance of older people is quite revealing in the context of the surgeon driving it, but also as you get a lot older, it appears that a 40% chance of survival is not that bad, if you should I mean, as you get very old. Then we have the societal decisions mixed in with then the what next decisions. So yeah. I've got myself to a place where if somebody, an individual really, really wants it, and the surgeon really, really wants to do it, and the care team wants to do it, providing there's a clear understanding about how we let things unfold that might result in an early death post-operatively, I'm in a more comfortable place. If people avoid those discussions and it becomes a protracted, prolonged, expensive, horrible, painful, slow death, I, I find that very, very difficult. So I don't yeah. know if that view's helpful. Yeah. And some, and some systems just can't afford to support that decision. But, uh, yeah, and I, would, I guess I would emphasize myself that we often talk in terms of a binary of yeah you know, survival or no survival. Um, I often hear this from um, both surgical anesthesia colleagues, uh, but of course there is very poor survival. Mm. Again, with high, high disability, I think many older people would prefer not to have that as a, a high probability outcome event. Um, now, sadly, we have to call this session to a close. I think we've got less than one minute or two to move to your next session. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for attending this session this morning, and particularly uh, my colleagues, Monty and Anushka. Thank you very much.